thanks to everybody for attending yet another uh, Let's Talk Recruiting session with all of our corporate recruiters getting together and talking about corporate recruiting. Today's topic is five things new recruiters should know about recruiting. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever went to school to become a recruiter. I don't think you can do that. Couldn't do it back in my day. Still don't think you can do it. We all have our stories of how we kind of fell into recruiting and what we thought it was going to be. At least for me, it is not what I thought it was going to be. Learned that the first week in. And it's sort of interesting. But with that, from experienced recruiters, what are the things that we would like people who are just starting off in this career uh, to know? So again, five new things recruiters should know about recruiting. And what we'll do is just sort of do a round table uh, with us, or soon to be with us, hopefully. We have Catherine Amato out of Los Angeles. We have Bennett Yang out of the San Francisco Bay Area. And Dave Wardwell out of Portland and Damian Fagan out of Los Angeles, along with myself, who's out of the LA area. Damian, I'm just down the street from you in Irvine. We, for, I just noticed when I was starting, we have an all West Coast presence for today's session. Usually we're spread out a little bit. Oh. So with that said, let's jump into it. And Ben, I'm gonna go to you uh, to highlight your, your item that you wanted to bring to the conversation today. Yeah. Um... I'll take a very brief moment to explain that I, I thought, thought I wanted, wanted to be an engineer coming out of school. school. So, so I actually have a degree in mechanical engineering. <laughs> really fascinated by how things work, specifically automobiles, planes, and anything with mechanical moving parts. Um, fairly early on, though, I realized there were a lot of people with gas in their blood, as they say. And I wasn't necessarily one of the most talented or gifted or energized people in the field. So, so I started, started becoming, becoming increasingly curious about companies, companies and organizations. Who gets, gets hired? hired? Why? Why do, Why do other, other people, people not hire? Finally. Okay. Hey, good, hey, good morning, morning, Catherine. Hi, good morning. Finally. Finally. At, At our time, time connecting, connecting, it wasn't connecting me. Oh, oh, no, no worries. worries. I, I sort, sort of started, started the introductions already. already. We're, We're going to go, go with Bennett, Bennett and then, then I'm going to circle back, back to you uh, at Bennett's, Bennett's through. through. And, and Bennett, Bennett, can I just say the fact that, that you have an engineering, engineering degree is cheating, cheating in my, my opinion? opinion. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, no. no be educated, educated in your area of recruiting is cheating to me. me. Uh, with that well, said, I should have picked software engineering. Still cheating. Still cheating. I was an English major, so anything with engineering in it, cheating. Um... Anyways, Anyways, I was, was just fascinated, fascinated by how companies, companies operated. operated. Who made, made the decisions? Why did those decisions happen, resulting in whatever it is we saw? So, so increasingly over time, time I, I started an agency, uh, commissioned sales, sales environment, environment, basically, basically starved, starved for the first, first year and a half, and nothing, nothing for people that are familiar with those kinds of situations. And then, and then eventually, eventually worked, worked my way in house. house. And, and I, I would say the bulk of my career has been working, working with software engineering teams. teams. Uh, spent, spent a lot of my career at Amazon, Amazon and, and these days, days I'm working, working with a smaller, smaller startup, startup called Soundhound in Santa Clara, California. California. So, uh, for, for me, it's always been first and foremost about problem solving. I've, I've had, had great, great curiosity, curiosity to understand, understand what, what kinds, kinds of things come, come up, up, what, what prevents, prevents organizations from being as successful as they like, what, what obstacles present themselves as we, we try, try and achieve a specific desired outcome. outcome. And a through line for me, uh, working as a recruiter and now leading teams of recruiters is we never know as much as we want, and we often don't know as much as we think we do. So discipline around curiosity is incredibly important. Knowing through the eyes of our hiring managers and our hiring teams what's holding them back, what kinds of things are going on in the environment, and how does recruiting contribute to that? What, what knowledge, knowledge about, about the current, current state of the marketplace can we contribute, contribute to the conversation? Um, I, try I try not, not to be arrogant enough to ever think I have, I have the solution, solution with a ribbon, ribbon on it, but, but what, what I, I know from lots of years of experience and repetition is when, when I bring, bring what my team and I know to the table, table solutions can, can happen a lot faster, a lot, lot more effectively, and a lot of organizational mind. Ben, let me ask you a question around that piece about questioning and learning and stuff like that. And I kind of kid you about having that engine degree. I'm actually quite jealous. Uh, for somebody who fell into recruiting, and my sort of story was English major, got into recruiting because a buddy was in it, started recruiting engineers. engineers uh, this is back in the late 90s, a lot of design engineers, manufacturing type people. And 
didn't know anything about engineering, but you, you have to know, right? So you can talk the talk. So where's that? Do you have any ideas? I'm going to kind of throw a curveball at you. If I'm that new young recruiter who doesn't know anything about engineering, but I'm trying to fill some engineering racks, that's, my, that's what's on my desk. And I want to ask those questions. That fine line between being inquisitive and then a manager who's too busy to answer questions, but I still got to get a few in there. Any thoughts around dealing with those managers who are too busy, but you really have some questions that you need to ask and learn from? Yeah, I really go back to the basics of active listening. Uh, despite the fact that your manager appears too busy and distracted, invest enough. The beauty of, of today, of the internet, is you can know a lot without really knowing a lot. So you've got to clearly break through that initial resistance from your hiring manager by demonstrating that you really care. The old saying is people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So the way you demonstrate to a technically focused hiring manager that you as a recruiting partner care is to show some curiosity about the topic. No rational, sane, normal hiring manager is going to criticize you for being curious about something that he or she has made their profession. So demonstrate that you've done enough reading, that you've ingested enough relevant content, that you can at least start to have meaningful conversations that are not distracting, not boring, not somehow uh, bothering the hiring manager. And eventually you'll get to the place where you demonstrate, is this an example of a good LinkedIn profile? Is this a good example of a resume? Are these the kinds of products that our company makes? Are the people who contributed to launching that specific product the ones that we should want to talk to? And slowly but surely, over time, you'll win that manager's trust and have better rapport. And you'll find that your partnership's much, much better off than it was on day one. Yeah, one, one thing that I used to glean a lot of information and learn from was doing reference checks, where I called the manager that an engineer reported to, and you could ask those questions. What did he do? What did he use? How did he do it? And then it, if the person was good, the manager's going to give, give you the reference, right? And just the way they would tell you in detail, to me, I'm just sort of listening. He's, he's telling, that's why we're on the phone. I learned a lot from that. And I kind of pair it back to my new hiring managers, kind of what previous hiring managers said in that, that lingo, kind of manager to manager speak. So that was a great resource for me. Uh, all th everything that you just said to that. The, the other angle to learn is from past managers and then that, that reference check was just like table was set for, Hey, tell me everything that this person did and how they did it. And a lot of information could, I would glean from there. That, that's great, Bennett. Did, did anybody else want to add into the, the Bennett's comments? Okay. Bennett, were you good? I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I'm good. All right, fantastic. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to sort of jump over to you. Sure. And I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, I'm just sort of going to, to your item that you had for the group. You just want to go with, with your item. Sure. So in recruiting, I think one of the, the key things that I found, and I've been recruiting for quite a long time and kind of fell into it um, after, you know, going to college and exploring what I really, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted something so bad I could taste it and, and just kind of fell into recruiting. But um, one of the things I found that through the times and, and I fell into recruiting actually in 1989 is you have to always be flexible. And the big buzzword nowadays is agile. And I found that whether it's as we come upon Rex change, the, you know, things are constantly changing and look where we are today with the whole COVID situation. And, you know, things were hot. We were hiring like crazy, what, even six months ago and things are changing and we have to be pipelining now or, or, you know, doing things differently. And if you can't be flexible or if you can't change gears, then you're going to be lost. And, uh, you know, whether it's a, a, the requirements of a job changing or, you know, things are always going to change. And you have to be able to switch gears. And as, you know, then it was uh, saying, Yang was saying, uh, you have to be able to listen. 
and being a good listener and listening to the cues that you get and, you know, be able to read behind that and be able to change and be flexible, I think is a real key thing in recruiting. And if you can't change and you can't, uh, you know, be able to take action on that is, you know, you're going to be lost. And I found that that was a real key thing to my success is be able to be open-minded and flexible. And that was key for me. It's always been, a, you know, a real key thing. Yeah, I would add, even from like being the big picture flexible, that I, I, I do not envy full life cycle recruiters. I know that's the majority of models that people are on. Whenever I've seen the, the ability to separate duties in the corporate setting where you're lucky enough to have a source or what have you, or even just schedulers, the, the being flexible part down to the day to day, almost hour to hour, how you have to change the primary purpose of what you're doing at the moment, whether you're dealing with a hiring manager, phone screening, interviewing, scheduling, travel, uh, counter offers, all of that juggling that happens by the hour. It's like I'll say recruiters don't even, they don't manage their calendars. It's too reactive because it's dependent on what other people do and when they come back with you. So Catherine, your point about being that reactive, ever-changing person, I, I can't emphasize that enough, both big picture and little picture. Yeah. And there's times where I've had to do things where that I really didn't want to do, or there's times where even now where I have to learn things that I really don't agree with or I don't like. And there's times where you have to be firm. I mean, you have to be who you are and, 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 you know, it's not changing to, to not be who you are, but, but there's times where you have to learn things that you, or do things that, you know, maybe you have to step out of your comfort zone a little bit, but as long as you're learning and growing and, and changing for the best, I think is, is, you know, important. You always have to stay true to yourself. But as long as you're in not going outside of something that tells you it's wrong, but, you know, to stay flexible and open-minded, I think is key. And I think to add on to what Catherine was saying, you know, about building a pipeline, you always want to have a plan B because maybe being flexible is not just being internally what happens within the company as far as hiring managers changing a rec, things of that nature, but also on the candidate side of things. Maybe they might not pass the background. You know, maybe um, something comes up on the candidate side where you have to have a plan B. So I think always being flexible on both sides for sure, overall. Yeah, because you're dealing with people. So, you know, things are going to change. And if you have your mind set on, okay, A is going to happen, then B, then C, then D, the equation doesn't always equal out. And so you have to always have something else going on and, and you have to be able to switch gears and think on your feet. You have to always be able to think on your feet because if, you know, you always have to have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, because again, you're dealing, you can't predict human behavior. And, you know. Excellent. And anybody else, Dave, Bennett, did you want to add to that? Okay. All right, so Dave, let's go jump into your item. All right. Um, for those who don't know me, Dave Wardwell. I'm with WebMD currently, um, and I've been recruiting both on the corporate side and on the agency side. I actually started on the agency side back during the dot-com boom, um, and then uh, back in 2007, I jumped over to corporate, and um, now back on uh, – went back to the agency side, now back on the corporate side. So kind of going back and forth both ways. <clears throat> um, my, my advice or my thought about, you know, if I could give me advice, you know, as a new recruiter, understand the importance of momentum in the recruitment process. Uh, momentum is really, really critical. Um, both Catherine and Damien, you guys were talking about, you know, just the human nature of, of recruiting, you have both a buyer and a seller on both sides. You have candidates, you have a hiring manager. And those things uh, can get stalled. You know, things can slow down. Um, and 
probably the most practical way of, of keeping momentum within the hiring process is understanding that there is no, there's only yeses and nos. There are no maybes in the recruitment process. If you go ahead and get into a process, a, a stage where you're talking to a hiring manager and they talk to a candidate and they go, mm, well, maybe, maybe they would be a good candidate. Let's look at some more resumes. That right there is not a good thing. Um, you should be um, encouraging the manager to say no or yes. Um, and they should be able to give you a good reason for a no or a yes. A maybe usually is an excuse to go ahead and kind of backburn somebody. Um, understand when a manager says maybe to a candidate, that candidate is sitting out there in limbo, not knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the role of a recruiter and keeping that momentum moving forward is to also making sure that we're being sensitive to candidates that are um, looking at our brand as a company. You know, mm -hmm. each of us uh, have a brand as a corporate recruiter, and that is the marquee on our, you know, on our company buildings and our brand and so forth. We want to make sure that we're paying attention to that. Um, uh, the thing is, we say no. So understand this as a, as a new recruiter. You say no to everybody except for one person on every rec that you work on. And that's really important to understand. It's like you got to get used to saying no and you got to encourage your managers to identify the difference between a yes and a no in that process. And that will keep the momentum moving to a decision point where we can hire that best candidate in the process. Now, there's a lot of nuance in there in what I'm saying, but from a practical standpoint, if you could go ahead and encourage your managers and you know to either clearly definitively say no to a candidate and move on to the next one, or say yes to the candidate and move them forward in the process, that will save you a whole lot of headaches and a whole lot of drama in the process. So, Dave, Dave, let me throw this at you around that keeping the momentum going. So let's say I'm that recruiter who's trying to do that and I'm, I'm learning, I'm, I'm new to the game. Less, mm -hmm. Let's say less than two years as a new recruiter. Um, patient, persistence versus aggressiveness. So to keep that, so I, what I'm trying to, let me see where I'm going here with this. I know where you're going, I think. Yeah, so like you got say, I would okay. say no to both of those. I would okay. say constant gentle pressure. Mm. Give me an example of gentle pressure. You know, so do you have a weekly setup with your manager to go ahead and talk about the recs and the candidates? Are you talking about every single candidate that's currently in play? Are you talking about, hey, I sent you over the phone screen notes on this candidate. I didn't get any feedback. Where are you at with that? Okay. It's just constantly reminding about candidates that are in play. Because each of us have a rec that has a candidate that ha is currently in play. They're either, we sent the resume to the manager that we already pre-qualified. We did a phone screen on the candidate. The manager did a phone interview on the candidate. There's always that next step. And constant gentle pressure is just going in and saying, hey, what's the next step? Hey, did you get a chance to review that resume? Hey, did you think about the the two candidates that you phone interviewed or your panel interviewed. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Catherine. So it's, so I think Dave, what he's saying, it's always about the follow-up. It's the options like, so are you interested in this candidate or do you want me to go ahead and let the candidate know you're not interested? So you want to give op an option because you're trying to get a yes or a no not a maybe, not the lingering candidate in the air, because you're going to lose the candidate in certain markets. You're going to lose the candidate. If, if the hiring manager is vacillating, you know, hey, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe. Well, no, guess what? They've accepted another offer. So if you like them, we're going to lose them. So it's, it's educating the hiring manager about the situations and letting them know if they don't make a decision, you're going to lose the candidate. So it's the follow-up and the reminders and the weekly touch base, as Dave was saying, 
and it's always the follow-up and it, you're trying to narrow it down to you know elimination yes or no because you need to use that as a benchmark am mm -hmm. i on the mark am i do i need to present another candidate or you're trying to close out the position bottom line but you want to know is this the right candidate or not so Bennett, Damien, did you have anything to add? I totally agree. It's all about, you know, the constant reminders, the feedback. Um, one thing that I personally do, that, and I love my ATS that I currently have. Wait, is, what do you uh, got? Damien, what are you using? Uh, Newton. Newton has a setting where basically it's required for hiring managers to provide feedback in order for me to move the candidate to the next step. So just making little requirements here and there, not putting too much pressure, <laughs> like Dave said, but just kind of having that pop up in their mind to provide feedback, I think helps out a lot. Yeah, one thing that I was taught when I was younger when it came to recruiting is disregard everybody's title. When I try to get in that balance line between being too passive to get things done or being too aggressive to upset your managers for, for bugging them, uh, you get to your point, Dave, do it that professional way. I always remember when you start dealing with directors and VPs and you're, you know, 20, mid 20 something, it can be a little bit intimidating. And I always thought, just don't ever look at somebody's title. They have their job to do. You have your job to do, do it professionally uh, in that world. And that was said, when you're young and you're just start, started talking to VPs for the very first time, it can be a little intimidating. All right, all right, Damon, let's jump over to yours. Yeah. So, just like probably everyone else on this call, I really didn't, you know, uh, look into get into recruiting. <laughs> I got my MBA um, in HR and healthcare services. Um, I started off in an agency and was filling positions anywhere from mechanical assemblers to clearance roles, pretty much uh, all over the U.S. Um, recently, or actually a few years ago, I got into my first corporate role. Um, where I'm an in-house recruiter and I manage recs anywhere from marketing, accounting, IT, uh, technical, things of that nature. And I would say transitioning from the agency to corporate, the main thing that I've seen as, as far as a topic, an ongoing topic, is employer branding. Um, you know, with the agency, I've had to fill so many recs in different industries, and I'm not going to name some of the companies, but some companies they didn't really have an employer brand that I can communicate to the candidate what the company was all about. And getting into a corporate office setting where I'm just strictly responsible for that, I have so much leeway to communicate what our company is all about. Um, whether that's you know via phone screen or just even on our website. And the importance of it for me is the some of the recs that I feel, it's so specific into marketing um that you know i have some candidates i look at our social media that pretty much reach out to me via linkedin things of that nature so i think that you know when communicating or when even having an initial phone screen some of the basic questions that i always get is you know what's the company about you know what can they offer me what is the team look like and luckily you know, with me having so much free range, you know, in regards to our LinkedIn profile, I'm able to upload, you know, different photos of what the team does, um, kind of talk about, you know, some of the team events that we have. You, basically, what I'm getting at is you just don't know the importance of employer branding until you get these specific questions on every phone screen that you do. <laughs> so luckily, um, I'm learning more so the importance of it and how to keep keep on going as far as communicating to the candidates why they should come work for us. I think it's really important that we communicate those details. Do you think that applies, Damon, to like uh, the young people in social media now where it's kind of just a transfer of what they do on their own social media accounts with their friends into a professional type style? Would, it, would, that, would that apply or? Very much so. Um, you know, recently I spoke on a panel with uh, the school FITM. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with them. Um, but we had a whole segment of employer branding and what you should put on your social media page, how you want your company to be perspective by others. You know, social media is such a, a big thing nowadays. Um, a lot of my hiring managers that are in marketing, 
they help me out thankfully a lot with our company website our career website what we want to upload as far as content so i think social media is a big aspect of everything how you want to present the whole company to be what about so we employee branding that phrase has been around for a while companies are getting there some more than others what about recruiter branding so let's say damien you focus on marketing type people or invented your team you're on engineering type people what about if i'm a, a recruiter that focuses on tech hiring right now right i'm the it recruiter in my company let's say that and i want to branding the company's great but what if i want to brand myself as a fantastic IT recruiter, getting back to pipeline and kind of carry that in my, my briefcase wherever I go, whether the current company I'm at now or in the future. Is anybody doing any type of self-branding in your niche, if, if you have one? Has anybody done that or heard of that? Self-branding, before we get into that, I would say more so research. Do your research on every specific role before you try to fill the position or even try to network you know um i think getting more i guess familiar with some of the tools that different you know recs require uh such as like it positions i think when you get into a network you have to really research you know what are all the special terms that you know these things require as far as like IT, engineering, things of that nature. But as far as self-marketing, um, I think that just networking in general, you know, getting connected on LinkedIn, you know, basically showing as much information as you can as far as uploading content to your LinkedIn profile, I think is the utmost thing that you can do. Gotcha. We, we got a question in the chat area about um, what are your go-to comments to sell a company that's not highly visible so if you're not a big brand name we're, you know we'll put this out to the group i just want to keep throwing it all on you damon uh comments around that if you're not well uh well known or you're kind of behind the scenes and, and i'll just throw an example out at you i heard somebody ask about a couple of years at a, at a conference and they were recruiting truckers i can't i can't remember what company it was but their job was to try and recruit truckers let's just say it's schneider um, they're like, what would I talk about? How would I try and brand my piece if I'm trying to recruit truckers? And in my mind, I'm like, well, I'd be doing social media about CB radios and the best places to eat on the road and just kind of going off the cuff a little bit to get truckers interest where it wasn't just about posting my open jobs, but really connecting and branding, hopefully long-term to them. Damien, I will throw this back at you. Do you have, around the, the chat piece of it around, hey, if you're not a well-known company how do you how do you get in the mix i think honestly it's all about word of mouth you know if they don't have a, a career website or you know not even a linkedin profile you know sometimes i get positions that are confidential and i can't talk much about our company or you know why we're backfilling the position what i touch base more on is the job itself and what i what information i can release um, you know, for instance, mom and pop shops, if whenever, you know, I was recruiting for those when I was with an agency, I would talk about specifically how well they did within the business, you know, whether that's within revenue or, um, you know, touch base more so on the environment, what are the hiring managers, um, what does the team look like, things of that nature. So I think it's worth more so word of mouth is what you could rely on if they don't really have a social media presence. I, I, I like going all the way back to Bennett's comments about being curious is probably really important because you need to know your audience. I work for a, um, I work for a big steel, manu uh, steel recycling company and they thought all of the people that they want to advertise to, they should put the to ads on LinkedIn. And it was like, these aren't people who are on LinkedIn. <laughs> this is metals recycling. Um, you know, half the people who actually were, we hired for our, our yards were ex-felons. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know a lot of ex-felons on LinkedIn. <laughs> so you need to know your audience and be very curious on, you know, you know, asking your hiring manager, it's like, where do you find these people? If you've never worked that kind of job, where do you find these people? I had a job um, back in 2008, 
you know, the guy was looking for basically people who originated LCD screens. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was only like a dozen people on the entire planet who knew how to architect LCD screens. And I, I said, where do you find these people? And he goes, well, I have a Rolodex. He gave me his entire Rolodex <laughs> and the third guy out in those Rolodex we hired. So it's like, I mean, you never know. You got to be curious. Um, you got to be very, uh, you know, uh, excited about what you're doing. I mean, definitely, uh, Damien, you know, being doing research on that role, but you need to know your audience. If, if, if you go ahead and think that everybody's going to be on, you know, MySpace. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. Oh, I mean, not everybody's on Facebook or Instagram right. or yeah. all those, but you just got to know your, where your audience sits. Yeah. You definitely have to know, I mean, regardless of whatever industry it is, do your homework. Find out, again, who the audience is, what the industry is, and find out where the industry is connected. Who are they selling to? Who is their audience? And that's where you really want to go out, when you're branding the company and who you're reaching out to. And that's how you brand. You connect with wherever that company is going to connect to. Who are their, you know, when you're posting jobs, who are they trying to reach out to? And, you know, embed yourself with what that company does and who their, you know, who is their audience. And that's what you really always want to do is do your research, know who you're dealing with and, and whatever company you work for. Or if you're on the agency side, because I worked half of my career on um, the uh staffing side and executive search and then I went on the corporate side so whoever I worked for or whoever I did the search for I always found out who the audience was who did they look for Captain do you think corporate recruiting and agency recruiting are two different animals I think they all have the same foundation mm -hmm. so they all have the same foundation and but when it comes to recruiting, recruiting is recruiting. The difference is on the uh, recruiting is recruiting, but the difference is when you're sitting on a seat with the, with the search firm, uh, at least when I did it, half of the time I was going after clients, and then the other half of the time I was recruiting. So, you know, you have that, that sales, you know, that sales side of getting clients. Whereas when you're on corporate recruiting, the reason why I stayed with corporate recruiter, I like corporate recruiting is because I really had a passion for recruiting and I didn't, and servicing the client. And I didn't want to spend half my time sitting on the desk trying to get the client. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I, I think that that's where there's a major difference is if you had to, if you were in a, in a, a, a staffing side where you had to get the client. Now there's differences now how, how search firms are set up where you just have someone doing just the recruiting and someone doing the selling. But back in the day when I worked it, you had to work a desk where you did both. Yep. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A new definition of full life cycle recruiting. Uh, when you manage your own destiny agency. Yeah. Uh, did, did, did anybody else have anything to add? I, mean, I have my last topic that I'll throw in. I know we're just a few minutes past the half hour, but did anybody have any comments to Damien's? All right, I will throw my item in here. And what I would tell somebody who's new in recruiting or think, even going back a little bit and thinking about recruiting is that it is not what you think it is. Uh, I started off with it the way it was told to me is you have people looking for work and you have people who are looking to hire people that are not to hire those people looking for work. I thought, oh, this is a win-win situation. This will be easy. But <laughs> it, it took about a week to realize, okay, this is not what I thought it was. At Catherine, to your point, at its foundation, at its core, yeah. But it is all about the people game and managing people both on the candidate side and the hire manager side talking to people you've never talked to before, uh, getting people to do what you need them to do in a timely manner. It is just a people game left and right. 
uh, learning about technology, so you need to be inquisitive. Uh, that's the piece of it where, yeah, you can't go to school for it, don't know what you would take. And kind of to that point, when I say it's not what you think it is, you don't know it until you know it and you get into it. Uh, you'll learn whether you like it or not. And I do think agency and corporate recruiting are two different animals. But again, Catherine, your point, foundationally, it's the same. But uh, you, you can survive in one and not the other, maybe mm -hmm. vice versa. But it's two different games, but it still comes down to managing people. So one thing I do want to add around that, a kind of question back to the group. And it gets back to I'm um, new in recruiting. How did I get in here? I always thought if, you know, you don't learn about recruiting until somebody tells you about it. And that's sort of my experience. Or you might see it and you wonder what that is. Or maybe you start an agency because they, they churn more. But it's like, to me, if, if you have tech support experience or customer support or telemarketing experience, that to me would be kind of a precursor to, hey, are you going to enjoy this recruiting piece of it? Because so much of it is done on the telephone. So I always tell a lot of this, when dealing with young people who are still in college looking for work, like I tell my children, get a job bartending through school. You'll learn all kinds of stuff that will apply later in life. You just don't know it yet. I think that's a great thing. Telemarketing or telesales or telesupport, anything to do with where you're conversing on the telephone, I think plays off into a lot of different roles. But let me just sort of throw this back at the group for somebody who's, who's thinking about recruiter, kind of taking a step back from being a new recruiter. If somebody who's, has a year in college left and they're thinking about this recruiting thing, any suggestions to them and getting ready for it? Throw this out to the group. I like the idea of starting out in agency, honestly. Um, as, as a recent college grad or even a you know high school grad, I mean, you have nothing, nothing to lose, <laughs> really. Um, and that's kind of a good way to, to, to start in that, uh, you know, you, you understand urgency. I mean, what you guys, you and Catherine were talking about, you know, the difference between, uh, the big difference between corporate and agency every person on the agency side has urgency because they're willing to put a whole lot of money down to find that person. Corporate can, you know, you can feel like a baseball catcher. Honestly, you can be just waiting for the pitch or waiting for the resume. Um, but I think, you know, what was that Catherine? I'm all not me. <laughs> but but um, I think, uh, you know, yeah, I think if you could start out on an agency, you know, agencies are willing to train you pretty, pretty in depth because they want to see you successful too. You know, on the corporate side, sometimes you may get more um, training in HR than you may get in recruiting. So just depends on the structure of the company. I agree. When I started off in the agency, I started off as actually as an onboarding specialist. And I got so much training within um, how to run a background, how to process drug uh, screening tests, things of that nature. And then that kind of opened the doors for me to get into recruiting. So I think I totally agree, Dave. Starting off on the agency side, you're kind of like <laughs> amongst all these other sharks. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you have to have that competitive drive to fill the wrecks. Whereas, like you mentioned, on the corporate side, the resumes are just coming in. So um, it's less, I would say, traction, um, but still more so that need to fill the wreck. Um, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if you can start out with a really good search firm right out of college, there's, I mean, you definitely work with the sense of urgency. If you can get a really, really good training and you can make good money too. But um, I think if you... Yeah, a good search firm, and, and it's very, very fast-paced, and you can get really good training, good foundation, and you learn a lot of different skill sets, And but you have to have a, a real good kind of sales personality and be able to take risks because it's definitely a different type of uh, role than going inside on corporate, but it's really, really good training. Um, if you can, if you can go, if you can see yourself more in a sales type role. Bennett, anything to add? 
I think my experience has taught me that I've, I've seen a lot of talented people come from unusual jobs and unusual places. It's that ability to set a goal, to persevere, to somehow figure out what feedback is useful, is relevant, and going to get you closer to your goal. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything the other panelists have said, but I've also seen a lot of edge cases where unexpected people ended up taking on really big jobs and delivering big results for the company. When uh, Trusty Cooper in the chat already talks about you starting the corporate side, starting off as a recruiting coordinator, I've seen quite a few coordinators move out of that position and into recruiting, so that's a, another option. Yeah, it, it ultimately comes back down to you can't go to school for it. You never really learn about it as a career option when it really is, in my opinion, a very interesting career. And if you're good at it, you can make a decent living at it. You can advance pretty quick if you're good, right? It's, if you're a really good recruiter and you're young, you're, you're going to advance. It's not like you have to put in 15 years to, to move up the food chain, so to speak. And there's always the, you can always hang your own shingle if you want to go that route and stuff like that. So it's a very interesting profession. We should get more publication in our in college and HR departments or what have you, but it, I haven't seen it yet. So everybody kind of falls into it, but that's, uh, I've been in it for a long time. Uh, I want to speak for Damien, but I think the rest of us, have, did we all start recruiting before email? Uh, I, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, I started before email came around. It was just your desk and phone. And Damien, you look younger than the rest of the panel. That's why I put you out there. But uh, yeah, Bennett and, and Dave, did you guys have email when you first started recruiting? We did kind of have email, but it was primarily fax and phone. That was, that was everything we did. And uh, one of the fun things I remember um, on the agency side, one of the top, top recruiters in my office, he, he often would go ahead and say, go into a restaurant where they have the fishbowl full of uh, business cards, give the host 20 bucks to go ahead and take the entire fishbowl home. Um, that, was, that was like, all right, you, you just don't do that now, right? You know, yeah. you just pillage LinkedIn or people's or company websites uh, directory. So it's funny. Yeah. I thought email was the coolest thing when I'm like, wait, you can just email these people these things? Oh, cool. So, yeah, dating myself a little bit, I guess. And our, the first agency I started out, out at, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, I started out agency. If we hit our quota for the week, we would go down to the corner tavern three o'clock on Friday and the owner would buy beer until everybody left. I thought that was the greatest motivational program I've ever seen. Haven't seen it since. But that's it. Well, hey, uh, any, any final comments? I'll, I'll wrap this up. I wanted to share really quickly. So I forgot to do a proper introduction. So I actually, I work for uh, at Guitar Center right now for our AV integration uh, business audiovisual design group. And so if anyone would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'd be more than happy to. But um, real interesting story. So when I first went, got into uh, on the agency site, uh, downtown Los Angeles, Bernie Howroyd, the owner of Apple One, is the person who hired me. And when I, they first asked me, oh, I think you'd make a good recruiter. And I thought, hmm, I'm not sure. Let me, let me think about it and get back to you. And I went to the library at that time, and I did all this research on what a recruiter was and what they did. And that's when I decided, yeah, I think I have all those attributes. And that's when I said, yes, I will definitely do this. So anyway, that's it from me. I just wanted to share. Excellent. All right. Well, hey, thank you, everybody. Let's sort of wrap this up. I, I thank you for staying on a little bit longer than we uh, have planned for, but I think the conversation was really good and going strong, so I did not want to cut it short. So with that said, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, All everybody. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good Bye -bye. day.